Well, Dad, the uh, title has already been referred to for the sermon tonight. <clears throat> As Pastor Matson introduced us and uh, led us in the song, he referred to good funerals. What is a good funeral? How can you have a good funeral? Well, I wasn't just trying to be spectacular. I think there is a good funeral. Uh, the funeral at the village of Nain in Bible times was a good funeral. I wish I could have been there. I also think that a, a good funeral is when the one who is asleep and the loved ones and friends who are there all have a meaningful relationship with God. And therefore they do not sorrow as those that have no hope. Our dad, uh, my, my dad, uh, one time was at a funeral in California where the 20-year-old daughter was asleep. She had been a beautiful Christian. And after the people had left and they were standing there, they had some friends who also had a 20-year-old daughter who was out in the asphalt jungle without faith and without God. And as they stood there, these friends of theirs said, uh, we would give anything mm. if our daughter was where your daughter is. Huh. Sealed with Jesus beyond the enemy's reach. Mm -hmm. That's a good definition for a good funeral. When I think about the good funeral, I can't help but think about what the counterpart to a good funeral would be. Um, you've sort of inferred that it would be a bad funeral if... The person wasn't in a relationship with Jesus who had fallen asleep. Are there other things that make a funeral bad, uh, maybe that <clears throat> come to your mind? Uh, yes, uh, most funerals. <laughs> <laughs> what is it about most funerals that you would say are, are, aren't, aren't good? Uh, Jesus is not the central focus. Most funerals, we uh, seem to be obsessed with two things, uh, to try and make sure that uh, we decide their destiny which is not our department at all. And uh, the other thing is that we eulogize the person and we talk all about the person. And Jesus is left out. I have seen this over and over and over again. And I don't understand why we do that because that is not the purpose of funerals at all. <clears throat> so you're suggesting that at the point of a funeral, at the time of death, uh, that, that if, if it's my funeral, for example, I'm not what counts at that point no. anymore. No. There's only one who counts at that time. That's right, and that's what makes a good funeral. The life giver. Where Jesus is the central focus. Go not ahead. the person. Not the person. Not the person. So if in my funeral they're telling about what wonderful things I've done and what a wonderful person I've been, it would be sort of like standing because death is, in a, in a way, death is sort of ushering you into the presence of God. It's almost as though you're in the throne room, in a sense, um, before, before God, the life giver, the one who, who holds life. So it's almost like if uh, they're talking about what a wonderful person I was, there they are standing in the throne room of God and saying, he was really good. You, you ought to be impressed with him. Um, he was very nice. And it's... It just seems to be the wrong place for boasting. Uh, a friend of mine, Bob Spangler, uh, killed in an automobile accident, uh, funeral at Loma Linda, uh, spent all the time talking about him. Uh, if he had heard it, he would have turned over in his grave. They hmm. uh, did the same thing with Harold Richards Jr., I think. Uh, most of the focus was on him. It's too bad. But you've been to some where Jesus has been the focus and you have felt a different sort of presence then? That's right. In fact, I think there are several occasions in the church when a God comes very close, the Holy Spirit is very near. One of them is a Christian funeral. Another one is a baptism. And another one is the communion service. Uh, these are special occasions when if your eyes are open and if we focus on Jesus, we can sense his nearness. Almost like the manna that fell on Friday came in double portions. Yeah. If our eyes are open, we would sense double portions of the presence of Jesus at a good funeral. Yes. Well, tell us more about what you like about a good funeral.
Recently, I um, have been going through some medical evaluations and discovered something that was pretty heavy, and that is that I have a terminal illness. Um, I don't know if that means anything to you. You might say, well, what's another preacher? But uh, <laughs> it's pretty heavy when you realize you have a terminal illness. And it's at a time like this that uh, you can find the wisest man who ever lived saying something that at first is a mystery. And you have to take a second look to understand what he's trying to say. Let's notice it in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 2. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. Solomon, what's wrong with you? He must have been depressed. Well, I guess he was depressed when he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. It is full of vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And here he comes along with this strange statement. It is better to go to a funeral than to go to a banquet. And uh, he needs to explain himself. Well, he did. For the living will take it to heart. Well, you go to the next verse and you find out that he adds insult to injury. Sorrow is better than laughter for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. Sorrow is better than laughter. Why don't you read your Bible, Solomon? A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. You know, if we didn't know how to laugh, we'd all go jolly around the bend. <laughs> and uh, so we ought to take a look at uh, what he's trying to say here. And he, he answers it, by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. And of all things, he says it a third time. <clears throat> the next verse. The, ha the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. In other words, wise people go to funerals and fools go to parties. Well, it took me a long time to try and understand that. And uh, finally, after trying to get a grip on it, it came clear one day as I realized just how much thinking I did about the things of time and eternity the last time I went to a party. Zero. How much thinking did I do about the things of time and eternity the last time I went to a wedding or a banquet? Zero. But how much thinking did I do about the things of time and eternity the last time I went to a funeral? A lot. You don't sleep at funerals. You don't even read books. You go there and you are sitting on the edge of eternity. The clock stands still and you are forced to think, which is not a bad idea, is it? Forced to think. Well, um, what shall we think about? Let's think about the bad news and the good news. First, the bad news. Not only do I have a terminal illness, but you have one too. It is spelled with three letters and the middle letter is I. Sin. We're all going to die. And uh, there's no question about it. You don't even have to go to the Bible to find this out. All you have to do is drive down the country lanes or through the cities and you find these places that look like parks. My father-in-law used to call them the marble gardens or the berry patch. And uh, <laughs> as you drive by, you know that these are <clears throat> silent monuments to broken hearts. And they remind you of the painful fact that we're all going to end up there someday. If you want to go to the Bible, you can go to Ecclesiastes 9, and there you'll find a simple statement on it. The living know that they shall die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. 
The living know that they shall die. My father used to tell about a Sunday school kid that got it backwards. The dead know that they are dead, but the living know not anything. <clears throat> and that may not be too far off <clears throat> when it comes to uh, how much we really do grasp and know about this subject. Notice the next verse. Uh, verse 6. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done unto the Son. Uh, right here we need to underscore the fact that the Bible teaches soul sleep. I realize that the vast majority, almost all of Christian religions, Christian denominations do not accept this. Uh, we are very much aware of this. There are only a handful of those who do. Uh, Jehovah's Witness, Seventh-day Church of God, and some like this. But uh, most Christian denominations believe that we go to our reward immediately at death. So uh, we take a second look at this in our subculture and uh, admit that there is no work nor device in the grave. It uh, describes death in Psalm 146, verse 4, where it says, His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, in that very day his thoughts perish. And this is important to know, because uh, if we know that the thoughts perish, then we know that there's no point in trying to get in touch with the dead. And this will save us from the occult and spiritualism and all kinds of deceptions that are prevalent in the world today. I uh, would just like to draw a circle around this great premise and uh, remind you that uh, some people think that Jesus taught otherwise in a common Roman fable that he used about the rich man and Lazarus, which uh, was not his purpose to teach about the state of the dead. He was trying to show the deceitfulness of riches. Some people take the thief on the cross as a proof that uh, we go to our reward at death. And uh, all they need to realize as they look at this text that uh, there was a misplaced comma and the thief did not go to heaven that day, nor did Jesus himself. So uh, let's do our own homework. I would like to invite anyone who listens to these words, do your own homework. Don't go by what has been most common or what someone has told you concerning the state of man in death. All right, so we're all going to die. And uh, that's a painful fact. Uh, Roger Williams said it. There's one certainty, death, surrounded by three uncertainties, when, where, and how. Someone wrote a song. We are going down the valley, going down the valley, going down the valley one by one. Going toward the setting of the sun. My, the, the juniors don't sing that at junior camp. <laughs> I much prefer another song that someone wrote. There'll be no dark valley when Jesus comes. There'll be no dark valley when Jesus comes. But uh, people have said it in different ways. Someone said we were born to die. And someone else said we... <clears throat> The heart is like a muffled drum beating a steady march to an open grave. Well, do I have you all depressed? <laughs> That's my first purpose, to get us all depressed. Because the good news is so much better in contrast when we realize how depressed we can get about the bad news. So the bad news is we're all going to die. The good news is, no, we aren't either. Not if we believe in Jesus. My uh, preacher father uh, used to have uh, funerals that he would uh, participate in. And uh, father and mother didn't always have babysitters, so my brother and I many times had gone to a funeral. And as a kid, I uh, learned to despise and to hate them. We'd have to file by with the rest of the people. 
and take that last look. I got to where I didn't even like the smell of the flowers. It was awful. My mother noticed. And one day she said to me, here, son, is a Bible text that maybe you'd like to memorize. It might help you. So she gave me John eleven twenty five. A text that is written over many a tomb, including George Washington. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. That's a good text. And uh, I memorized it. And after that, when uh, people would get together for worship, sometimes around the piano after singing some songs or around the fireplace, uh, often someone would say, well, let's go around a circle and everyone say a favorite text. And someone used up John 3.16 right away. (laughs) And then there was this long silence. And about that time, I'd come in with my favorite text. I am the resurrection and the life. I uh, like that text. I didn't even notice the meaning of John 11.26 until years later. Look at this. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe that, Jesus said? Never die. My. This book does not know anything like terminal illness for the believer. There is no such thing. It just doesn't exist. I have had a good time going to people who have the so-called terminal illness and I go to them there in the hospital. I say, I've got good news for you. What is it? You're not going to die. Oh, they say, but the doctor said, no, no, you're not going to die. But what about the medical report? No, no, it makes no difference. You're not going to die. You might sleep, but you won't die. Jesus has said it. He has promised it. What we call death, Jesus had something better to call it. He called it sleep. And in John 11, verse 11, he uh, said it concerning Lazarus. He said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. One of these days when Jesus comes again, Jesus is going to say, my friends are sleeping as he looks down on the uh, millions of graves. But I go that I might wake them out of sleep. That's good news, isn't it? Now, uh, I'd like to remind you that uh, if you're a friend of Jesus, he's not going to let you die. If you know him and he knows you and you are in close relationship with him, you can count on it. It comes with the territory. He's promised that you will never die. Someone says, well, we'll get eternal life when we, you know, the resurrection, when Jesus comes. No, go through John, his gospel and his letters, and you find that he says it over and over again. We already have eternal life now. So we don't have to even wait until the resurrection or until he comes. We have it now. And uh, we might sleep, but we still have eternal life. Now, sleeping is not all bad. Uh, My brother and I used to fight in the back seat of the car on the way home late at night from some distant place. Uh, My folks would say, hey, why don't you... uh, and go to sleep. Well, we hadn't thought about that. We uh, spent our time fighting and asking how long it's going to be. When are we going to get there? The same thing happened with my kids. I had a daughter, a little daughter that said it this way. When are we going to be he? When are we going to be he? <sighs> so uh, finally, uh, by accident, we'd go off to sleep. And the very next instant, we were driving in the driveway at home because there was no knowledge of the passing of time. 
Isn't that good? Let's look at 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, the famous passage on the resurrection. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. There's the promise. <clears throat> Those who are asleep will wake up, and they have had no knowledge of the passing of time. Which means that Abel, probably the first one who went to sleep, and has been asleep for over 5,000 years, will have no more knowledge of the passing of time than the person who dies 15 minutes before Jesus comes. Just like that. Isn't that amazing? To close your eyes and know that the very next moment you'd see Jesus coming is a wonderful thought. Something else we are told. Our thoughts will take up where they left off. C.T. Everson, the great evangelist of yesteryear, <clears throat> used to tell us in the 30s beautiful language that uh, painted pictures on people's minds. They didn't have high-tech things in those days so he would spend his time painting pictures on the canvas of people's minds. Like this. What an awakening day it would be to wake up in the bottomless pit of death, to rub your drowsy eyes and say, where am I? And then you look around and you hear a, a gunman from Chicago cursing over here. And you hear a harlot from Kansas City screaming over there. And as you look around, you see the devil and his imps everywhere. You've come up in the wrong resurrection. Well, that got people's attention. <laughs> On the other hand, he would say, what a wonderful day to uh, go into the valley of the shadow with the name of Jesus on your parched lips and to realize that the Son of Righteousness lightens up that valley with resplendent glory. And then to wake up having taken the name of Jesus on your lips and realize that this is the right resurrection. It's good news. So the gunman from Chicago, his thoughts take up where they left off. I've got to get him. We had a German pastor in Northern California where I was working one time. Ben Riley, he uh, was a nice man. We all liked him. He had a little broken English. My father was with him one day when they were at Monterey Bay, when getting ready to buy the Monterey Bay Academy land from the government for a dollar. <laughs> and uh, as they looked at it, toward the ocean, Ben Riley said, well, here always they can look at the ocean. And my father said, uh, Ben, uh, you should say, here they can always look at the ocean. He said, yeah, that is a good correction. Here they can look at the ocean always. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were all shocked when we heard one day that uh, Ben Riley, on his way to the conference office in Oakland had a head-on collision and was killed instantly. We gathered there in the uh, Lodi for the funeral. The conference president uh, led out in the funeral. And I'll never forget his description of how our thoughts take up where they left off. And he pictured the resurrection morning and Ben Riley comes out of the grave and he says, I gotta get to Oakland. <laughs> then he looks around and there's an angel there. And the angel says, no, you're not going to Oakland. We have someplace better for you to go. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? We went out to the cemetery and we had the uh, finale there. And after the people had left, I was standing there with another minister and we watched them as they uh, put on the heavy cement lid and poured in concrete. And I said to him, do you think the angels will be able to get through that? He said, don't you worry. Don't you worry. 
Yeah. Well, now I come to a practical question. How do I know I have not been brainwashed by all of this belief? I mean, I'm a third generation Christian, a second generation preacher. And uh, I listened to my son and he could do a good job of brainwashing me too. <laughs> and uh, I have heard this all my life. So maybe it's just, uh, it depends on where you came up, your environment, as to why, what you believe on this subject. I moved to a town in Oregon to pastor one time, south of Portland, Newburgh, McMinnville. And uh, some of the people in the church said, you should go to a certain barber. He likes to talk about the two untouchables, politics and religion. So I went to this barber. He was a great tall man who had to sort of stand like a giraffe with his feet apart as he cut hair. <laughs> and uh, he was just beginning on me when he said, uh, what do you do? I said, I'm a preacher. He said, uh, what church? I said, Seventh-day Adventist. He said, why are you a preacher? And I gave him what I thought were some good reasons for being a preacher. When I finished, he said, uh, what did your dad do? <laughs> well, <clears throat> he was a preacher. <laughs> then he said, uh, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Oh, what a glorious opportunity. I uh, unfolded all of the good reasons. I figured I'd have him in the baptismal tank by the following Sabbath. When I finished, he said, uh, <clears throat> what church did your dad belong to? <clears throat> Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> and I knew right there that I would have been better off as far as reaching that barber if my dad had been an atheist and a drunkard. You know what he was thinking, sure. It's your environment. <clears throat> You've been brainwashed. That's why. So how do I know that I am not following cunningly devised fables? Well, I would like to tell you how it dawned on me that it's 100% certain. Now, I used to use a little thing that my father gave me one time. If you're talking to someone who's a skeptic and does not believe, you can tell them, hey, I uh, can't prove that uh, it's true that there is God in heaven and eternal life, but you can't prove that it, isn't, that, it, that it isn't true. So why don't we, uh, just on the basis of logic and reason, we'll leave the Bible clear out of it. On the basis of logic and reason, let's shake hands, and I'll give you a 50-50 chance that you're right, that it's not true, if you'll give me a 50-50 chance that I'm right, that it is true. Well, they say that that's fair. I've tried this on students, and it works. I've gotten a lot of mileage out of this. <laughs> so then I tell them, we go ahead and live our three score years in 10, and we find out that, that you were right. It's not true, there is no God in heaven and eternal life. We both die, and we're both buried in the same dust, and I haven't lost anything believing the way I did. I went to the same place you did. But if on the other hand, at the end of three score years and 10, we see a cloud coming and then the whole heavens is filled with angels. It's true, there is God and Jesus and heaven and eternal life. Then you have lost just about everything. So my pitch then is, it is the smart thing to believe in God and heaven, just on the basis of logic and reason even if there's only a 50-50 chance. But then I discovered I was wrong. It's 100% certain. Really? How do I know? I learned it the day my mother died. She was 91 years old. She took sick one day and died the next. I hurried to St. Helena where she was and 
I was by her bedside the last four hours. The loved ones stood around. We held her hand. We shouted in her ear that we loved her. We thought maybe she would still hear us. And then we saw the monitor go flat and we felt her hands get cold. It was over. And we looked out the window and we cried. And then something hit me that I'll never forget. The thing that hit me was the wonder and mystery of life. What was it that kept that heart beating 91 years without slumber? Tick tock, tick tock. It wasn't mother. It wasn't the devil. It was God. And as it hit me, the wonder and mystery of life suddenly dawned on me that uh, God, reality of God, and what he talks about in the Bible of heaven and eternal life is 100% true because of this one mystery and wonder, life. Which means that I have as many proofs that it's 100% true as I do have hearts beating in this audience right now. Have you thought about it? Life. You cannot explain life. God only has immortality. Look at it. First Timothy 6 verse 16. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords who alone has immortality. God is the author of life. And we haven't been able to come even close to produce life. Not even a blade of grass or a kernel of corn. We've had a lot of smart people in the realm of science and invention but nobody has come close to producing life. Oh, we play around with it, yeah. And we have done wonders in that arena, but we cannot produce life. You can take a kernel of corn and you can take it into the laboratory and break it down and find out just exactly what elements are in it and in what proportion, but you cannot take those elements out of the lab and put them together and have a kernel of corn with life in it. You can't do it. I have read what the ingredients are that comprise the human body. And you can go down to the drugstore tonight and get all of them, I guess, put them in a brown bag and bring them home. Add water and stir. <laughs> you don't even have to go to the drugstore. All I have to do is get a shovel full of dirt out here. Add water and stir. What do you get? Mud. We cannot produce life. And yet look at the wonders that we have been able to produce. 747, for instance. First time I saw a 747, Emilio Connectly had come to our church in Mountain View for a weekend and we took him back to the airport. And the doctor and I that stood there and watched his plane take off saw the first time a 747. And as it went into the air, the doctor said, it's gotta be of the devil. <laughs> 747, which is longer on the inside than the Wright brothers' first flight. <laughs> the airplane, one of the most outstanding inventions that was ever made but we can't produce life. My brother and I used to play at Aunt Lucy's in Newburgh, Oregon, out in the country. In her woodshed, there were <coughs> cobs of corn that had been lying there in the dark for years. We could take those out and plant those kernels of corn in the right environment with sunshine and water and they would produce hundreds of other kernels of corn. Life. I understand they've done it through the, in the Egyptian, uh, from, from past, past years in the Egyptian uh, pyramids, kernels of corn still with life in them. No, you can't argue with the wonder and mystery 
of life. We had a smart kid who was a, a son of some professional people in Grand Junction, Colorado, where we were pastoring. As he grew older, he was too smart. He reasoned his way clear out of the faith. One weekend I was back at Grand Junction having a weekend of meetings and someone got him to come. And I was talking about this very subject. The wonder and mystery of life proving 100%. And at the potluck he came to me and said, you got me. You got me. I believe that there is God and heaven and eternal life. Then he said, how do you know which denomination or which religion? I said, can you come back to another seminar sometime? <laughs> well, my father died before my mother. He uh, was 86. He was about 14 months dying. We ended up praying that he would go to sleep. He had something like dementia. He could hardly recognize us at the end. But finally he went to sleep and we gathered for the funeral. My brother and I had the funeral of both our father and mother. And uh, after the funeral, we went out to the cemetery and finished up. Everybody left except my brother and my son, Lee, and I. We waited. We wanted to make sure that they did it right. These rednecks came and they uh, took away the pretty stuff. And we saw only an open dirt grave. They lowered the casket into the grave and then they began shoveling. And Lee couldn't handle that. He jumped forward, took a shovel away from one of the men. They stood back in quiet respect as Lee shoveled and wept and shoveled and wept. until he had it all covered. Then he gave the shovel back to them. <clears throat> I said to him, Lee, how could you do that? He said, how could I let them do that? He remembered how that not long before he had uh, stood in front of Grandpa one day Grandpa had put his hands on Lee's shoulder and said, Lee, I got some advice for you. And Lee had thought, well, what else is new? <laughs> yeah, he says, I got some advice for you. Don't get old. It doesn't pay to get old. He says, I keep talking about Jesus so we don't have to get old anymore. And we remembered that there. Then my brother said something. Don't forget, he said, that the very next moment, as far as dad is concerned, he'll wake up and he'll say, well, what do you know, I live to see Jesus. <laughs> Watch this. <clears throat> it makes no difference now because he's alive when Jesus comes. Yeah. And it was the ne very next moment after he closed his eyes. Later, the last time I was with my mother, we went out to the cemetery and we stood there at the grave of my father and we looked at the headstone and it had his uh, beginning and ending dates. It had her beginning at blank. <laughs> and as we looked at it, I wondered what she was thinking. Finally, I said, Mom, uh, what are you thinking? She said, well, I, uh, I've done pretty good to live this long, haven't I? Let's have a little prayer. So uh, 
We had a little prayer. Then she said, now let's go get a candy bar. <laughs> Took her to the drugstore. I walked in and I said to the lady at the desk, uh, what kind of candy bar do you get your 91-year-old mother? She said, any kind. <laughs> My mother had a great sense of humor, and uh, my brother and I have often been grateful that she passed it on to us. At mom's funeral, I reminded the people of my mom's singing. My mom could never carry a tune. We used to drive along in the car, and we would try to get her on tune, and we'd coach her. We'd hit the note and then we'd ha have her hit it and then we'd go to the next one. It just uh, <clears throat> didn't work. She could not carry a tune. But she loved to sing. And while she was ironing, she would sing. Off tune. Just when I need him, Jesus is near. Some of the most beautiful singing I ever heard. Amen. So I invited the people there to sing that song at the end of the funeral. And I asked them if they didn't carry a tune to sing extra loud. Because <laughs> I wanted to be reminded of my mother just when I need him most. How can I be certain that I'm on the right side? And that I can wake up if I sleep. First John 5, 11 and 12 again, the good news. This is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God has not life. If you have a relationship with Jesus, the Son, you have life already. Amen. Let us rejoice and be glad.
Lord Jesus, hasten the day when we can look into your eyes, recognize the smile there, hear your friendly voice say, welcome home, children, and be reunited with those who have fallen asleep before us. We can't wait, and we're so glad that you've made it possible, and so we give you praise in your wonderful name. Amen.